Okay, so this um, recording deals with cognitive development, looking specifically at Piaget's theory, Vygotsky's theory, and information processing approaches. All right, so let's talk about Piaget. So Piaget, um, in this particular period of development, we're in the pre-operational stage, so between ages two to seven in Piaget's theory, and we see that there are several gains here in mental representation. So that's the ability to use symbols to do this kind of deferred imitation. And we see lots of gains here compared to the previous stage, the sensory motor stage, and we'll talk about those gains. But there are still several limitations that Piaget proposed children have during this stage, um, and we'll talk about these here as well. All right, so early childhood development, development of make-believe play. So with make-believe play then, um, Piaget believed that through pretending, young children practice and strengthen their newly acquired representational schemes. So for Piaget then, remember, um, these representational schemes, these are basically symbols, right? Being able to understand that something such as language stands for something else. So with these representational schemes, we see the development of make-believe play. So over time, play detaches from the real-life conditions that are associated with it. So play starts to represent, right, something else. And play becomes less self-centered as preschoolers realize that agents and recipients of pretend actions can be independent of themselves. Play includes a more complex combination of schemes. So for example, in something called sociodramatic play, this is make-believe play with others that is underway by the end of the school year. Children display an awareness that make-believe is a representational activity. So they start to be able to play make-believe with other people involved. So with the particular benefits of make-believe play, lots and lots of things that are going on here, um, but in terms of looking at the benefits here, play not only reflects, but it also contributes to this child's um, cognitive skills, right? So their ability to think, to reason, and it contributes to their social skills as well, right? Especially when they are involving other children. Um, strengthening cognitive abilities, children who are engaged in make-believe or pretend play have an ability to sustain attention so they can focus, right, on what's going on for longer periods of time, um, increases in memory, ability to use language and literacy, more creativity, emotional regulation can be a side effect of this as well, and the ability to perspective take, so the ability to see something from someone else's point of view. So lots of great things going on here with Make Believe Way. Okay, so looking at um, dual representation, so this is something that's going on here as well during this particular time period. Until about age three, children have trouble with this, with this dual representation. And dual representation is basically viewing some kind of symbol or a symbolic object as both an object in its own right, so an object as a mean in and of itself, and also as a symbol. So for example, um, experiences with diverse symbols like photos, picture books, make-believe play, and maps can help preschoolers to appreciate that one object, so one photo, for example, can stand for something else. So adults can really help children understand this concept of dual representation by showing them that, oh, this photo here is a photo of a flower, but it also stands for a real flower. So it's a photo in and of itself, and it stands for something else as well. Okay, so with um, Piaget's theory then, he believed that children in this stage are limited in a number of cognitive capacities. So he believed that children are egocentric. So egocentrism is basically the failure to distinguish someone else's symbolic viewpoint from your own symbolic viewpoint. So his um, 
he basically tested this using what's called the three mountains problem and that's what you see here um, in this particular um, photograph here so basically with the three mountains problem Piaget would take this girl who's in the front here this girl who's closest to you on the screen and ask her what the other girl on the other side can see okay and so if you look at this it's kind of hard to tell in the picture but the girl on the other side with the dark hair that girl can't see exactly what the girl in the front can see. So the girl on the other side with the dark hair probably can't see that there is a little blue house on top of the first green mountain. And so when Piaget would ask, you know, what can the girl with the dark hair see? He believed that um, children here would often say, oh, you know, she can see the same thing that I can see. She can see that there's a blue house on top of this mountain. And so for Piaget then, that was evidence that children in this stage are egocentric. They can't assume the other person's point of view. They can't understand that the girl with the dark hair doesn't have the same perspective that you do um, in this particular case. Okay, so Piaget also believed that children in this stage are bound by animistic thinking. So with animistic thinking, this is the belief that inanimate objects, so inanimate, this means objects that are not alive, such as the stuffed animal in this picture, the belief that inanimate objects have lifelike qualities, such as thoughts, wishes, feelings, and intentions. So it's very common during this stage for children to believe that their stuffed animal, you know, feels things the same way that they do. Obviously, that is not true. Okay, so conservation then. Conservation is understanding that physical characteristics remain the same even when the appearance changes. So children in this stage are very focused on um, they can't understand this concept of conservation because they're limited by what Piaget called centration, where they focus on only one aspect um, to the neglect of all others. And they also are bound by this concept of what's called irreversibility, where they're unable to mentally reverse um, a series of steps. So they're unable to mentally go through a series of steps in a problem and then reverse directions, ultimately getting back to the starting point. Okay, so what does this look like? So with conservation then, Piaget would give children a number of tasks to do. And again, children in this stage do not understand that just because the physical presentation of something changes, the actual properties remain the same because they are bound by that concept of centration where they only focus on one thing, one aspect of the problem. All right, so let's look at the first one here, looking at the number. So Piaget would present children with pennies in this row, and you can see that each row has six pennies. So you would ask a child, are there the same number of pennies in each row? child in this stage would say, yes, of course there are. Okay, now you transform one of the rows here. So you can see that in the top row, you have added space in between, and in the bottom row, you have reduced the space in between each one of these pennies. So now it looks like the top row is longer, right? It's taking up more space. And so for a child in this pre-operation stage, that is what they focus on. That is what they centrate on, how much space is actually being taken up here. So after you have transformed these rows of pennies, you say, are there the same number of pennies in each row or does one row have more? Now a child in the pre-operation stage will say, the top row has more, okay, because they are centrating, they are focusing only on the physical space that the pennies are taking up to the neglect of counting, right, the number of pennies. So you and I can clearly see that there's the same number, right, of pennies in each row, but a child in this stage does not get that. Same thing goes with clay. You have um, two equal balls of clay here. You flatten one out. The child in the pre-operation stage will say, oh, the flat one has more, right? It's taking up more space. 
Um, same thing if you look at the water here, the child in the pre-operation stage will say that the taller glass has more water because again, they're centrating just on that concept of how much physical space. So they don't get this idea of conservation. So looking at the evaluation of um, Piaget's theory, researchers have challenged his view of a cognitively deficient preschooler, notice, noting that preschoolers' response to Piaget's problems might not be a really accurate reflection of their true abilities because the problems that he gave preschoolers, so the way that he tested their particular skills, were really unfamiliar problems, so things that kids hadn't really encountered before. And it may have also had too many pieces of information for kids to really be able to handle all of those pieces of information at one time. So looking at their egocentric thinking and their animistic thinking, when researchers use a more simplistic task, kids are able to understand something from someone else's point of view. Um, he also seemed to have overestimated their animistic beliefs. So, for example, preschoolers rarely attribute biological properties like eating and growing to inanimate objects like robots. And this tells us that kids are aware that even a robot who has lifelike features is not alive. So Piaget may have overestimated um, their animistic thinking. Looking at the um, pre-operational approach as a stage, so some experts state that there is perhaps a more flexible stage notion here, right? That these competencies seem to develop over an extended time period um, instead of looking at this as one particular um, stage in development. All right, so let's focus then on Vygotsky and Vygotsky's sociocultural theory. So for Vygotsky then, um, his theory stresses the social context of cognitive development where rapid growth of language broadens a preschooler's participation um, in these dialogues, so conversations between um, more knowledgeable individuals within their culture. So with private speech then, Vygotsky talked about private speech um, as basically this language that's the foundation for all higher order cognitive processes and children basically speak to themselves. They talk to themselves to give themselves guidance. And so for Vygotsky, as children get older and tasks become easier, their self-directed speech is internalized as this kind of silent inner speech. So they're basically, you know, kind of talking themselves through doing a particular task. So in Vygotsky's theory, then, he talks about something called the zone of proximal development. And the zone of proximal development basically looks at the kinds of tasks that a child can achieve with the help of a more knowledgeable individual. And so in the zone of proximal development, um, more knowledgeable or expert individuals aid a child in learning by scaffolding or providing supports to get a child to the ultimate end point. So let's say that you're trying to teach a child how to tie his or her shoe. An adult might scaffold that experience by walking a child through the steps. First you tie a knot, then you make a loop, then you loop it around and you tie it tight. So the adult is scaffolding that experience by providing supports along the way. So looking at an evaluation of Vygotsky's theory, um, one challenge to his theory suggests that verbal communication is not the only means through which children develop thinking. So for example, um, in some cultures there is um, not as much focus on language and other routes of cognitive development are more important. So for example, another theorist, Barbara Rogoff, suggests the term that's called guided participation, which refers to some kind of shared activity 
between a more expert and less expert child without talking about or specifying the precise features of a communication. So you would basically walk a child through how to do something, but you're not talking about it. You're basically showing them, okay? So showing them exactly what to do. You're guiding them in how to participate. Another criticism of Vygotsky's approach is that it says very little about how other capacities like your motor skills, problem solving skills, contribute to higher cognitive processes. Okay, so let's look at an information processing approach. So with the information processing approach, we're focusing on cognitive operations and mental strategies that children use to transform stimuli. So to transform things in the surrounding environment to their own mental systems. And in early childhood, the core, um, the components of executive functioning that enable children to succeed in cognitively challenging situations, including things like attention, the ability to control your impulses, and planning, show really impressive gains. So with attention, for example, um, we see lots of great things going on here. So compared to school-age children, Preschool kids generally have shorter attention spans, so they spend shorter times involved in tasks and they're easily distracted. But in looking at something like inhibition, so attention improves in toddlerhood and beyond as children steadily gain in their ability to inhibit impulses and keep their mind on some kind of more long-term goal you can actually scaffold um, attention skills for young children. And in terms of looking at planning, by the end of early childhood, children become much better at planning. So their ability to think out a sequence of acts ahead of time and allocate attention in reaching a particular goal steadily improves. In looking at memory, so preschoolers' recognition memory is pretty good at this point, um, but their recall is much poorer. Okay, So their ability to recognize things is good, but to recall information from earlier times, not so good at this particular point in development. Their episodic memory, though, memory for everyday experiences, continues to build during this particular point in time. So they become much better at remembering familiar events or being able to provide a general description of what occurs and when it occurs in a particular situation. <clears throat> We also start to see um, the development of what's called emergent literacy. So emergent literacy, um, at this particular point in time, children are starting to develop these language skills, right? So emergent literacy then are children's active efforts to construct knowledge about literacy. So this is knowledge basically about reading, about being able to process language. Um, and this happens through various informal experiences that we'll call emergent literacy. So with these emergent literacy experiences, we see the development of what's called phonological awareness. So phonological awareness is the ability to reflect on and manipulate the sounds. So the sounds that form the structure of spoken language. So kids who are <clears throat> really good at this um, generally are better at reading later on down the line. More informal literacy related experiences that a young child has, the better their language and emergent literacy development and later reading skills. So for example, these are things like a child who has um, the opportunity to be exposed to various um, complexities in language. So a child who's spoken to often, who has the experience of being able to um, look at books, to read books, these children will generally have a better um, time later on down the line. 
If we look at other things that can foster emergent literacy, looking at teachers who are well-trained, this is a good thing. Also providing books for families who come from a more impoverished background. Um, oftentimes there are very stark differences in the kinds of reading materials that are available in middle and higher socioeconomic status families compared to lower socioeconomic status families. So looking at mathematical reasoning um, in early childhood, so very similar to literacy, mathematical reasoning builds on informally acquired knowledge, starting with a beginning grasp of what's called ordinality. So this is order relationships between quantities, and this occurs generally between about 14 and 16 months. So children start to understand that there are larger and smaller quantities of things. Between ages three and a half and four, most kids can grasp this principle of what's called cardinality. So cardinality, this means that the last number in a counting sequence indicates the quantity of items in the set. So you're counting something and you stop at four, that tells you that there are four items in this particular set. There are four crayons on the table. Um, so around age four then, children start to be able to solve arithmetic problems. So they can start to add quantities together, for example. Um, we see that, again, there are differences in socioeconomic status that children from low SES families begin kindergarten with considerably less math knowledge than more economically um, advantaged children. And oftentimes this gap is due to differences in the environment, so the quality of stimulation that these children are receiving in relation to numbers.